Now, you're all very welcome here uh, this afternoon. Um, could I just please, first of all, remind you, as I remind myself, to turn your phone to silent if you haven't done so already. Uh, no need to share our ringtones uh, around the room. Um, we'll be finishing up um, at about 2 o'clock, so if anybody needs to dash out in advance of that for whatever reason, feel free to do so, if quietly. Um, but can I just say how delighted I am personally and how delighted the Institute is professionally uh, to welcome back uh, Judy Dempsey, uh, Senior Research Fellow at the Carnegie Institute. Um, Judy is a, is a long-time uh, friend of the Institute and has been over on a couple of occasions uh, sharing with us her analyses on European security defence policy. Um, as you know, she's a, a journalist by background and training, um, is now sort of a, a, an analyst and commentator, um, and is the editor of what is, without a shred of doubt, the very best blog on European security, foreign policy, and defence. That's on that record. E that exists. <laughs> that exists. That is on, on, that's not Chatham House. That is on the record. Um, and so what we've invited Judy to come do uh, for us this afternoon is, is give us her take on basically <laughs> Trump and everything um, related to European security defence, particularly Trump and NATO, mm. and perhaps draw out some of the implications of that mm. uh, for the development of European security defence policy, which, as you'll know, has, 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 take, has, has, has been undergoing some significant development over the last uh, 12 to 18 months and is not least <laughs> in part a function of the rather problematic relationship uh, that the uh, that the Trump administration has with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Judy as her remarks will be on the record and then the Q&A will be on uh, on Chatham House. Okay. So Judy. Yeah, thanks well, Ben. For, uh, thank you Ben for this introduction. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me again. It's very nice uh, coming back to Dublin. I'm, I'm based in Berlin. So I will uh, slightly have a German perspective as well. I mean this is a quite an awesome title because um, it, I have to deal with so many issues but I'm going to go through them in a coherent way as possible and leave plenty of time for questions. So um, I, think, I think we have to start with what has happened over the past couple of days and it's the decision by President Trump to pull out of the INF Treaty. Uh, this is very serious uh, for the West, it's very serious for European security and um, it actually in a very short-sighted way, plays into the hands of Russia. Russia was playing back and forth with the INF Treaty. This is intermediate nuclear missiles. It's extremely important for the stability uh, of the alliance and the security of Europe. Without that, we are actually highly vulnerable. And um, we have to be very careful of the implications of this. Um, President Trump uh, intends to meet President Putin in Paris next month, where... Uh, he may try to bully Putin into drawing up a new INF treaty, but these take an awful lot of time, and these take a huge amount of confidence-building measures, and they are not in place at the moment. So this is, um, uh, uh, it's not even a footnote, this is a major um, aspect. It feeds into President Trump's um, ambivalence towards NATO. NATO is part of the INF, not as an organisation, but in terms of the security umbrella. Um, this is one aspect of, of Trump's so-called ambivalence. The other, the other aspect of, of um, Trump's attitude towards NATO is that he doesn't see its value or its worth because he sees um, relations in transactional elements. So what he wants from NATO is value for money. He doesn't really see it in a broad security sense because for, for Trump, NATO is about you know, troublesome countries, well-off countries in Europe that can look after themselves. What Trump has taken to an extreme form is what the Obama administration uh, started doing. And uh, Obama, the Obama administration and his uh, Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, were extremely critical of the European allies in NATO, simply because it's not that they weren't spending much. We spend 180 billion euros a year on defense. But it's how we spend it, what we do with it, and how we... Um, how we see defence and security strategically. And we don't see it strategically because we have been dependent on the United States since the post-Cold War period. And dependence creates a kind of intellectual laziness. It creates, um, it creates um, a psychological aspect that well, there's no need to do anything because um, the United States will always look after us. And I'm actually more, I'm more and more convinced that the United States will continue to look after us, but on very different terms. The, 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 the playing field is, is changing as we speak. Um, Trump is only interested in the Middle East through the prism of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 
Um, do you see what he's doing uh, in Syria. He's given the ground to, I mean, the players in Syria. It's it's devastating what has happened. Um, Trump's um, focus is now on China. Russia is a hindrance. It's a problem. Um, he he, because of his special um, advisors in, in in the White House, um, he knows that. Putin is, is a problem, but he's not going to be as critical on Putin as he on China. China is uh, the United States bet noir at the moment. And because of this complete focus on Asia and China, this is actually another reason why the Europeans inside NATO should be worried. Um, the Europeans, um, so far the reaction to Trump has been, um, has been, on the one hand, deferential, especially the Secretary General, I wonder if there's anybody from Norway here, deferential to say the least. Well, Stoltenberg got his second term a couple of days before the NATO summit. But um, on the one hand, and secondly, um, one of serious, um, and this is the good thing about Trump, the Europeans are beginning to think, well, what is security and defence nowadays? I mean, are we going to be always relying on NATO? If so, what does this mean? And the weakness of the European argument is that they don't have a strong, coherent European caucus inside NATO. They have both, the French have their own agenda and a strategic outlook. Britain, leaving aside Brexit, has a completely different outlook. But inside NATO, the Europeans haven't decided where they want to take NATO. And why is this? Leaving aside Trump's criticism of NATO, why, why, why doesn't NATO, um, the Europeans in NATO, A, get a caucus and decide which direction they should take um, NATO? Okay, I wanted, these two maps are, are quite important. On the grey area is, your, is, is the eastern neighbourhood, and uh, this one is the southern neighbourhood. The problem with these two areas is that they encapsulate NATO's dilemma. NATO still doesn't have a common threat perception. For the eastern, for the Baltic states, for Poland, Czech Republic a bit less so, but also watch out for Norway and Sweden and Denmark. Their threat is Russia. The, Russia's invasion of, of uh, Ukraine and Russia's take it to, uh, when it an illegally annexed the, the Crimea, this actually changed the, the fundamental geostrategic dynamics of these countries. And it was the Baltic states, supported by Norway and indirectly by neutral Sweden and Finland, that pushed and pushed uh, NATO to actually go back to basics, go home, conventional uh, movements and boats to the eastern defences. It must also be noted that when uh, the Baltic states uh, joined NATO in 2004 and Poland and Hungary and the Czech Republic in 1998, um, NATO actually never provided air defences for these countries. Uh, these countries were actually unprotected. Yes, they did uh, exercises with NATO, but essentially the Baltic states had no air defences whatsoever. And I remember this discussion coming up. In 2004, the Estonians were saying, where are our air defences? And these were the good days of Russia. Well, we don't need them, everything's secure, everything is stable. So now, because of the situation in Ukraine, the threat perception of these northern countries and the Central and Eastern European countries, that their threat is Russia. Now, if you go down here, um, NATO, uh, sorry, just to slightly go back here, NATO, as you know, they've got a couple of ten, you know, five or 6,000 troops now stationed in, in the Baltic states and in Poland. Frankly, it's peanuts mm. because we're not going to get a conventional war with Russia. We're already getting a very different kind of war, a cyber, a cyber security war, a misinformation war. We're getting a war, a total disruption. I mean, this is what f uh, fake news is about. Total disruption, and conventional forces cannot stop that kind of t disruption. But from a political and psychological point of view, having NATO so far to that border is, is, um, is extremely important for the Baltic states. It's hard to believe that Russia would actually uh, challenge NATO on this. They don't have to challenge NATO in other ways. So the threat percep perception is clearly uh, there, and NATO is involved there. Could do much more, but uh, limited <coughs> resources. Here... It's, um, it is, if the threat perception, if the, if the threat perception is the north, is the, is the northern countries, the threat perception it, it, uh, focused on the southern neighbourhoods is held by Spain, Italy, Greece, Turkey particularly, these, uh, uh, these important members of NATO. But the point is, NATO's 
actually not, not present there. They're doing some st stuff in the Mediterranean, but frankly, its airspace is already limited by Russia, and they don't have the political and military means to stop it. This is the first thing. And secondly, since uh, NATO is actually damaged goods because of the botched up operation in Libya. It changed from responsibility to protect to actually uh, regime change. And we're paying the price now with a huge refugee and migration issue. And I cannot see NATO in any way going back in there. They just wouldn't be support for this, not from, especially not from Germany. I'll talk about France later. But NATO is on the sidelines. But this is a, but this is a major threat. It's a, it's, a, it's a threat about stability. It's completely insecure. And of course, um, the big issue that dominates all the EU member states whether you're the north or the south that brings them together, is the refugee and migration issue. This is not going to go away. And it's not going to go away, even if um, the numbers are down, and even if we get the so-called um, Frontex beefed up and so on. Um, the area around Niger, Angela Merkel visited that for the first time, Chad, uh, very unstable, Sudan, we know exactly what's happening there. Mali, these areas, uh, Mali is now extremely unsta unstable because of the the return of the Turaga communities from Libya, who were treated well under Gaddafi. These were fighters. They've gone back to Mali, and we know that M Mali is now um, being kept stable by French forces. Um, it's very important with support uh, with intelligence with the Americans. But the key country to watch is Niger, because the speed of climate change is phenomenal. And the climate change is leading to rapid desertif desertification. And people are forcing to leave. This is not economic migration. It's, it's migration of existence. And they're, they're going across Chad. They're trying to go to the north, uh, into the north of Sudan. In Egypt, it's impossible to get in there now. Uh, Libya, and try to get... This is a huge crisis waiting to explode. And so when Merkel and, and uh, Macron and others <coughs> and the EU Commission visit or talk about North Africa, um, this is not going to be solved in you know, two years' time. This is serious climate change catastrophe waiting to happen. It's already happening. And uh, development aid, uh, job opportunities, this, it's not going to make a difference. This is about seriously tackling the agricultural shortfalls and the universal problem of climate change. I mean, we've seen the summers here in Europe. It was devastating. And in Australia, there hasn't been rain in New South Wales for a year now. It's, it's devastating. But here's the... Here's the critical point for Europe's future stability. It is not, we are no longer having the arc of stability, which was the first uh, European security document mm -hmm. which Solana did. We have arcs of instability, and they are there to stay for the foreseeable future. So whatever, whatever Trump's uh, um, um, ambivalence towards NATO is, NATO is sitting on huge... Um, huge time-sensitive issues, and we really don't have that much time to, to deal with them. Another aspect which, um, which feeds into this is that if NATO is divided over the, the sense of threats, um, it's not doing enough, and maybe it's not its job to deal with this whole cybersecurity. This is a civilian issue. NATO's divided. Some say, you know, this, this should be left to um, the civilian arm. Nothing got to do with, with the military. But above all, um, NATO, and NATO and Trump have started a, quite an interesting... It's not yet got off the ground, but a debate um, inside among the European member states is what is European defence? Is Europe ready to defend itself? Does it understand what security means? Does it understand the real implications of making strategic decisions? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. There are two major strategic players inside EU um, and the European caucus of NATO, and they are Britain and France. Um, and it's very interesting that over the past eight or nine years, Britain and France did these um, special uh, defence agreements. Why? Because they didn't believe that the EU could do s European security and defence. In fact, they were pretty disgusted that got, little got so done. So they had these uh, very interesting agreements, whether it was um, the, the, uh, the, um, the nuclear sharing, certain aspects, and also um, combat units, they didn't quite get off the ground, and because we had the San Malo between Tony Blair and Bra uh, uh, 
Jacques Chirac that went back to 1999, the great ambitions of getting 60,000 troops ready in the space of three months. Well, dream on, we can barely get 1,000. We can't even um, transport 5,000 up to the Baltic states because we don't have a NATO Schengen. We don't have the airports, the little airports, the trains, the railways, the infrastructure, the bridges. <clears throat> so that's, that's another issue. But that feeds into European readiness. Is Europe ready to defend itself from the cyber security, from mistakes, from, from small conventional wars, and of course from terrorism, which don't forget it's still there. It feeds into the resilience which we still haven't got. So there's been a couple of ideas floating out there. Angela Merkel, no fan of NATO, no fan of, of hard power, said a year ago, well, Europe now, it's time... In, in the context of Trump, it's time that Europe took matters into its own hands. Well, she never pursued it. And Angela Merkel has never really given a, a speech on defence. And, and when she goes to the NATO summit, she really doesn't say much because she feels uncomfortable with it. It's not just about her East German upbringing or anything. Uh, it's the militaristic thing she doesn't like, but above all, she doesn't like to address hard power. And there's only two or three or four member states in the EU that address hard power. Britain, France. Don't write off the Danes. The Danes are very, very interesting. And, and the Norwegians are very interesting through their history and tradition. Uh, Denmark is a really fascinating uh, case of, of strategic thinking. But um, I didn't want to digress. So since the EU is not ready for resilience, and um, the EU cannot agree on the threat perception, except perhaps for terrorism now. I think it's hitting home, not uh, on the uh, not on the Visegrad four, but generally. <clears throat> uh, and above all, since they can't agree in hard power, we have a fragmentation of the EU, and which is being developed into coalitions of the willing. And uh, we have the acronym of PESCO, where all the EU member states join. It's quite uh, bureaucratic. It's uh, I see it more as a talking shop to try to bring together capabilities. Mm -hmm. But the most important one is President Macron's European um, initiative, uh, European intervention initiative. This is a really interesting initiative. Already he's got eight groups around him. And Brexit or not, Britain wants to be part of this. And he needs Britain to be part of this. Essentially, it's Europe, get ready for an intervention force. This is not about crisis management. It's about preemptives as well. We have to preempt and we have to go in when we feel that our interests and our security has been threatened. And he's trying to give leadership to this. And um, it's very important to remember that not only is this a coalition of the willing, and you can join, opt in, opt out, it's free of the Commission, mm. and it's free of the European Council. Now, some countries may say, oh this, oh, this is France throwing its weight around. Well, frankly, since the EU isn't going to do any of this serious um, crisis management on a hard power level, uh, France wanted to <coughs> lead it. Um, the interesting reason France is doing this is not just because of the deficits of, of European common foreign, and, uh, foreign defence policy, it's because France can no longer do it alone. It's overstretched. It's already heavily involved in, 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 in Africa. Um, as a quid pro quo to get other EU member states to join his European intervention force, um, he sent up a few, a few troops to um, Poland. Yeah, just, you know, we're, 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 we're okay. And, and Germany did um, France a favour by sending troops down to Mali. Um, but let me know, let me tell you that um, there's a couple of, maybe there's a, maybe a hundred German troops, not one Arabic speaker and not one French speaker. They rely on interpreters and imagine if the interpreters were killed and upset. So it, it was all about a favor. And so every time you hear the German Bundestag say, but we're helping Macron in Mali, well, um, you need a proper infrastructure. I mean, it costs a huge amount, these operations, rotation, um, infrastructure, logistics. And, um, but, you know, Ma Merkel gave Macron something. But Macron hopes he'll get this. It, it would be kind of a, a mini NATO caucus yeah. in some ways. That's the interesting thing about it. The other interesting thing about it is that, <clears throat> apart from Macron's initiative, uh, what's happening in, in the north is... Uh, Finland and Sweden getting much closer to NATO. And these two countries, neutral, just to remind you, 
Um, the, it's fascinating that they're, being, they're heavily involved now <coughs> in big NATO exercises. And so everything that Putin did to try and weaken NATO, especially weaken the northern flank, has backfired. And one of the positive aspects of, of, Turkey's, um, of Russia's invasion of, um, of Ukraine is the fact that actually the Europeans have been pretty well together on sanctions and on, on the threat, even though the threat perception is different. But they've, they've all rallying around it. And now even the neutral countries, um, the, the, the very important ones up in the north, are now seriously... Um, not revising, they're seriously moving much closer to, to, to um, NATO, which is, which is very, very interesting. The, and the other aspect, which it depends on who you talk to, because um, you know NATO has one culture, the EU has a, a, a different culture, but the EU and NATO are beginning to work closer together. Um, and this is, it's very important because it will stop this ridiculous duplication and hopefully weaken the competition. I don't know, they think they can compete with each other, but the EU cannot compete with NATO um, on, on military issues, and NATO cannot compete on the EU on soft power. And marrying hard power and soft power is, just would be the ideal um, uh, uh, the combination. And it would be ideal because NATO is very bad at soft power, and the Americans are very bad at soft power in the day after. And so when the Americans went in Iraq and Afghanistan, and when NATO went into, <coughs> went into Libya, no, no follow-up, no civilian infrastructure building, no follow-up on how to deal with the day after. Um, I read somewhere yesterday that the Americans are great at going in, but are pretty bad at um, fixing things afterwards. And so we're living with the, the, the disaster of Libya. Um, Ukraine so far you know, seems to be managing, but the Minsk process, which is led by France and Germany and Russia and Ukraine, has reached a point that it's, it's just hanging in there. I mean, the conflict is not over in Ukraine, but Eastern Ukraine, by any stretch of the imagination. And there's one, um, and my last point, and it's a rather um, <laughs> one I've been thinking on for some time, is this idea of um, it, not only the ambivalence towards NATO, but NATO. Um, NATO encompasses the transatlantic relationship. NATO is about Atlanticism. At least it used to be. Um, this, uh, this Atlanticism um, has, I think, outlived its usefulness because the idea of the West has been challenged now by China and has been challenged by what's happening in the Trump administration. Um, the, the narratives coming out um, uh, among commentators is now, oh, NATO and, and the West and America, um, this is the end of the old liberal order, as we know it. Let's save it. And, um, but we have to have a look at this liberal... Why, why do we want to save it? Why is, there, why, is there nobody, why, why is everybody wanting to save the liberal order? Because the liberal order after 1945 was imposed by the United States. It created the new Germany, the, the Western Germany. It built the democracy there. And can you imagine what it did to Japan? It's extraordinary. And this liberal order was based on uh, the idea of a moral order and an order based on rules and an order based on, on values and the rule of law. And what we have now is, for many, many reasons, we have the, the idea of moral politics and the values and the rule of law being threatened from within the EU and, of course, being threatened outside, even from within the United States. This is an enormous responsibility for um, our friends in the United States, but it's an enormous responsibility for the, European, for the Europeans. And in order to strengthen this Atlanticism or save it, we should actually stop thinking in America, European terms, and think of a new Atlanticism that would include like-minded countries. We need to bring in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, we, we already have Canada, some of the more, uh, Latin American countries. We need to broaden it out, either through trade deals, but also broaden it out to, to widen the appeal of the West. And the, the appeal of the West is wide. Reformers from, from living in authoritarian countries still look to the West as, as, the, as, the, as the protector of the values of, of the rule of law. You can have no security without the rule of law. 
uh, people uh, and um, without the rule of law you won't uh, you won't have stability you won't have structures you won't have you won't have liberal values and instead of moaning uh, rightly so about trump's ambivalence towards nato what we now the europeans should have a big I I say in this again with our constituency friends in the united states but bringing in other countries we have we must create a, a new a new broader wider architecture because contrary to what the populace might believe and the anti-globalizers anti the west is bigger actually look at the countries in the africa union that want to actually deal with the corruption build up grassroots civil societies i, I maybe this counterintuitive but i believe the west is getting bigger but we should actually capture this moment and build on it through linking trade, security and defence with the values. The 1945 era is closing, there's no doubt about it, but it doesn't mean that the West is over. Thank you. Thank you.